I'm trying to share the screen with the draft. So once I manage to get that working, we'll start. Uh, okay, um, so uh, am I muted? Yes, I'm muted. Okay, so hi, thanks everybody for showing up. Um, this is going to be uh, a Zoom meeting. Uh, first, I'm going to ask for volunteers. Does anybody uh, would like to take minutes of the meeting? Uh, who is that? It was Matthias. In Paris. Ah, okay. Hi. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, so if you just take some notes and then send them to me, I'll share them on the group. Okay. Uh, cool. Thanks a lot. Uh, other than that, let's get started. First, let me just recap the purpose of uh, this meeting, and then we'll proceed through uh, step by step. So. Well, basically, did you to, sorry, did you intend to record the meeting or no? It's recorded. Uh, it's already been recorded, I believe. So yes, thanks for that. Uh, and just for your everybody's information, the meeting is being recorded. Uh, so just FYI. Um, if you could also mention that the, the note well applies and um, to take attendance, that would be appropriate as well. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Colin. Uh, yes, the uh, standard IETF uh, not well applies. Uh, do I need to share a link to that? Or uh, if you have one handy for the IRTF not well, that would be helpful. Uh, it's the same one as we always have. Oh. I seem to have lost the IRTF. Not well. Uh, okay, sorry, I wasn't aware that it also applies. Well, should have been aware that it applies to virtual interims. Uh, I have the link somewhere. Uh, I'll yes, but then IRTF not well applies. Ah, oh, there it is. Uh, I need to share it on the screen. <laughs> and yes, attendance will be uh, taken. I'll. I'll We'll take it from the attendance list of the uh, Cisco WebEx. Mm. Thanks. Oh, yes. There you go. Uh, do, do, do IETF not well, PowerPoint format, PDF format, should be open. Yeah. Uh, yes, as uh, uh, for everybody's information, IRTF uh, applies. Uh, IPR rules, uh, privacy and code of conduct. Everything's in the link that Colin posted. Uh, okay, so let me start by a recap of what the goals of this meeting are. Uh, so it's getting towards the end of work on the architectural principles draft. Uh, it's been going on for some time. Uh, the last section that he's working is kind of what now that all the introductory material has wrapped up. Uh, there is kind of effectively kind of the, what, what this whole draft was kind of going towards was a outward look looking forward 
a section which is more about what based on what kind of principles what kind of goals do we have uh, for our for a quantum internet uh, so and that's the kind of goal of the section it's not meant to be particularly long or it's not meant to be particularly opinionated it's not meant to be particularly uh, as a kind of you have to do you must do things this way because Obviously, uh, practical developments uh, will generally overrule any sort of idealistic principle. But it's kind of—I felt it was kind of good to at least outline uh, kind of goals and principles because these things will kind of, first of all, help people also understand what is it that we're building, and also because this is particularly an area which will benefit heavily uh, from insight from uh, people from outside of the quantum current quantum internet community which is uh, has a lot of physicists so i kind of pointed out in the uh, email that i sent out that um uh, i particularly uh, would like uh, contributions i think well i particularly think contributions from people who have seen how the internet has developed and the history the mistakes that have been made etc how that could apply to the quantum internet so having Assuming the knowledge of the content of the previous parts of the documents to how the quantum internet was, be, was roughly going to be built, uh, let's go over uh, the section six of architecture principles, which is split into two sections. Well, I split into two sections. That may be up for debate. One which is goals and one which is principles, which comes later. The idea of goals being not so much rules, but roughly like what should we be on the lookout for uh, as we proceed with the quantum internet? Like, what, what, do, what are we building this quantum internet towards? And the principle is being more like, well, now that we specified what we're building the quantum internet towards, uh, what's the rough set of good kind of rules of thumb, good principles we should stick to? Uh, I've linked in previous emails, and I will link uh, maybe in a follow-up what documents uh, that kind of inspired me to start this section. But let's now just... Uh, Kind of go through this and the idea of going of this meeting is we'll go through what's currently there and then i want to also open up the floor to others to kind of add in their contributions and basically say what do they would like to see in the goals what would they like to see in principles uh i'm not particularly confining the i don't want to confine the debate to anything that's already there and i'm very open to additional ideas so having settled that uh let's go over uh the goals uh so the first goal that i've listed is and the way i want to discuss these goals is i'm going to briefly describe them and if anybody has anything to say it's just i don't know to add something to remove something or if they don't think it should be a goal please let me know I, i'm also up for removing things that's also up for discussion so the first one i listed is to support distributed quantum applications. And the point of this goal is to highlight a key difference between classical networks and quantum networks, which is that classical networks are ultimately about data transmission. And whilst quantum networks can also achieve data transmission, uh, fundamentally, a lot of applications do not necessarily need the data transmission part of quantum. Uh, for example, quantum key distribution does not need to actually transmit quantum data, but merely needs that stronger than classical correlations uh, provided by an entangled pair of particles. And that's effectively what this part is saying, is that because of this difference, we need to develop uh, metrics that are meaningful to these kind of applications. So for example, a throughput uh, is not particularly meaningful alone. How many entangled pairs per second do we achieve? If we're also not talking about the fidelity of these entangled pairs, uh, because the fidelity of these entangled pairs uh, plus throughput, uh, if, if they're not of an, even if you have a large throughput but low fidelity, that may not that may actually require many reattempts at the application level, which is undesirable. Uh, so that's basically it. it's all about basically saying the goal of a quantum network is slightly has to be very slightly different, and we need slightly different metrics. Or that I'm not stating what these metrics should be, merely that they should probably also include fidelity with throughput. Does anybody yeah, want to add anything? Right. 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 For the minute, they understand that, that uh, we uh, meet that, that even though in the first place we want to have, have uh, 
uh, data transmission, we realized that we needed to have entanglement distribution for that. And, uh, you, and then we realized that entanglement distribution is, uh, allows a wider use than just data transmission. And so which in the end, we, 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 we conclude that the overall goal is not data transmission, is entanglement distribution, and I mean, uh, non-classical correlation establishment, and, and, then, um, and, and then all that follows uh, to characterize this. Is that, is that correct? Uh, yes, that is correct. Um, okay. Thank you. So anything to add on this point? Remove, change. It might be useful to include a reference to the use cases draft um, for an overview of what these applications might be. That is a good point. That, that was something I was about to mention too. Yeah, agreed. Okay, making a note. Okay. Anything else? Or I'm going to move on if there's anything else. Okay. Uh, well, that was a pretty straightforward. Uh, the next one is basically saying the same thing, but also saying that currently we can't really do much with our early stage hardware. Uh, QKD is possible with non-quantum repeater-based technology. Uh, and the whole point of uh, this point is kind of to emphasize that we want an architecture that can support uh, applications that have that may have quite heavy hardware and research requirements. And we're not building an architecture to support just QKD for the nearest future. There are QKD in, in, in networks, but they're kind of they're they're not based on quantum repeaters at the moment, uh, and the idea of networks being built with quantum repeaters is that they kind of go beyond quantum V distribution, and the point and the goal and then this goal basically states don't just think about what's possible today, and whilst the current if for people who actually look at current hardware it may may very quickly conclude that many applications are simply just not really possible or they are not possible over very long distances, we should not confine their architecture based on those limitations. Uh, this is a kind of point I'm not sure if it's worth stating or if it's worth adding anything to it. This is the kind of question I have about this point. Does anybody want to say anything about it? I think it's worth uh, stating because when designing an architecture, you really want it to be like uh, usable tomorrow too. So. It seems like a good requirement for any architecture now. Uh, thank you. Uh, who was that? So that for the purposes of minutes. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's uh, Raja. I'm a PhD in uh, Paris. Okay, nice thank you. you guys. Uh, anything else to add on this point? No. Uh, OK, uh, moving on. Supporting harder heterogeneity. Uh, the key point is, it's kind of like, I mean, in classical networks, there's also harder heterogeneity. I'm not particularly familiar with the harder that really goes into that. Currently, the harder heterogeneity, ideally, I'm not sure how much you should actually account in protocol level. I've personally found that you do actually have to think about this quite a bit actually at the protocol level. Because for example, some quantum repeater architectures, uh, for example, do not support deterministic entanglement swaps and the entanglement swaps with only a certain probability. And that's something, for example, a protocol would have to take into account. Uh, and it's kind of hard to hide in the hardware. Uh, then there's also the idea that some links can produce uh, entangled pairs almost deterministically with very high fidelity, uh, but some links require multiple attempts, and, uh, and that also is kind of a bit hard to sweep under like the hardware rug. Uh, and that's kind of what I'm saying in these goals. Uh, I haven't actually written much on this point, so I don't know if anybody feels like there's something to add to this support hardware heterogeneity point. So anybody have anything to add to this point? 
Yeah, this, this is a comment from the perspective of a classical network engineer. One of the problems with, that we've run into with classical networks is this concept of uh, flag days, uh, where you have to upgrade the entire network to introduce some new capability, uh, which is very undesirable. Um, so this sentence that you have, where all the where all the nodes have essentially the same are capable of executing the same set of tasks is too strong, and you might have different. You might run into a in, in, into a situation where different nodes are fundamentally capable of doing different things, and so in the classical world, for example, some nodes can do v6 forwarding and some cannot, and so it's essential that the architecture has this concept of capability discovery or capability negotiation. So that you can introduce new technologies gradually without requiring flag day upgrades. That's an excellent point. Who, who was that? Was that Bruno? Yes, it was. Okay, good. Yeah, I agree. That's uh, that's very useful. I'll weaken the point about same uh, uh, roughly the same capabilities, and I'll basically add the point would be to avoid things like flag days and through effectively some capability discovery negotiation mechanism. And to kind of support and to achieve the goal of hardware heterogeneity. So the goal could be support hardware heterogeneity. And I guess that would tie in with a principle which would basically say we need to support some kind of capability discovery negotiation. Goal would be effectively to avoid flag days. This kind of opens up a whole, a whole uh, new uh, ball of uh, wax, I think. A whole new hairball there. Uh, hey, it's Rod. Um, I was actually going to comment right before uh, Bruno piped, piped in. Uh, I was I was going to say I think I've mentioned this before. Um, it's not just hardware heterogeneity, but it's also heterogeneity at the at the um, protocol level, in particular at the error management level, as we potentially progress from one uh, G to two G to three G networks. I think. I think White Tech and I've been talking about that one since uh, last fall and have had something of a difference of opinion on that one. But yes, yes, I'm sure that pretty strong. Yes, and no, I've been changing my stance on this as the discussions have been progressing. Uh, that's a good thing you bring up. And I do actually want to include now more uh, discussion about these uh, generations. Uh, and it's still waiting us effectively with Shota's uh, pull request. Hi. Um, and, Hi. Uh, the, uh, well, hang on. Uh, let's see. Hi. This I've, got, is, I've got one more comment, but go ahead. Hi. This is sorry. Um, this is uh, Steve Willis. I'm more classical internet person. Um, support hardware her her heterogeneity. Don't we also have qubit heterogeneity too? Don't we have CV and DV uh, technology in here? And should that be? I, I tried to figure out quickly scanning this whether that was encompassed in this. And so, is that also part of heterogeneity? Uh, the experts. I'd say intuitively yes. I'm not sure what you mean by these qubits. Do you mean like the different? Well, you mean different types of qubits? But what, what kind of different types of qubits do you mean? Well, I think the reference was uh, discrete variable versus versus continuous variable. Oh, that's correct. oh, that's a good. And yes, that's 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 a legitimate question, and that's again, that's a that's a big ball of worms. Um, the, uh, the CV people do things very differently at both the physical and logical levels. It's not clear they have anything that corresponds to a qubit, and so it's not clear that it's that it's actually interoperable with repeaters. Although you do actually see you, know, you see references to systems that are uh, continuous variable QKD systems, and so so they are uh, imposing something of a bit like regime on top of the CV, but. I'm not sure if we want to try to cover that in this document or not. I would lean against against it. This would be my own. I, all I wanted to do was point out that, and and it, I have no problems with getting rid of it, and just simply that that's something that exists. Uh, yeah, that's a that's a good point, but yeah, I'm kind of with Rod on this one. Uh, yeah, perhaps it's worth at least mentioning somewhere that this exists. Um, Certainly, I, I some of the most the interesting uh, experiments, some of the earliest experiments, and all of this stuff came out of 
um, CV work by uh, Akira Furusawa, who, who was uh, a postdoc at Caltech and is now a professor at the University of Tokyo. But the, uh, it's a very different thing. Uh, yeah, I, I, yeah. So I'm gonna go with saying that we're probably worth mentioning somewhere, but not worth going into detail. And I don't think, and actually, in that case, in, in, in to answer your question, uh, it's not gonna include in the support hardware heterogeneity. Um, I I have just posted on the chat uh, a link to a reference that precisely does that. Uh, I mean, maybe Steve can confirm, but uh, I would I would recommend to take that into account. It's a possibility. Okay, so actually, so because this continuous variable discussion is a bit bigger, I'm going to move it to the mailing list, uh, and we'll see what actually comes out of that. Good idea. It is a big ball of worms. Okay, this is uh, Rod again. I had one more comment right here on the support hardware heterogeneity, but it's actually probably as you move into number four, you need both number three and number four. Oh, so and should they both be combined into one point? Yeah. Uh, probably. Um, what did I write in four? Uh, I guess in the first one I said that there may be multiple types of hardware. And the second one I said, I guess I also included the concept that different type of hardware may come in the future with better capabilities. I think number four encompasses are actually, there is some interest in keeping the number four separate, but I'm not sure if it's strong enough. So one of the things that's important about protocols is that they operate across, or at least that I feel is important about protocols, if you can correct me if that actually is important, is that protocols work across, uh, at least the fun fundamental protocols work across a range of orders of magnitudes. So, they, so that they operate at low rates just as well as they are, well, or at least they operate at low rates, but they can also operate at high rates. Uh, so I don't know, just say take IP. IP can run your network at home, uh, and IP can also run on the networks uh, in the backbone of the internet. And I think that's what I was kind of got alluding at in the fourth point, but not in the third point. And I'm not sure if it's actually worth kind of keeping these points separate then. Uh, and if that makes sense. The explanation would be to merge them. Uh, by the way, so it's, it's Rod again. And by the way, everything I have said so far and everything I'll say tonight, unless unless I say otherwise, is as a uh, an individual contributor and a co-author on the draft, not as chair. I have a comment about that, uh, number three and number four. Yeah. Uh, to me, the number three, it is a goal because it's a report. Um, and the number four is more like the how to do that. So to me, four. Uh, could be one of the design principles uh, who would move down below, um, not including the goal. Uh, well, that is a good point. Actually, that's the way the way it's phrased. I I would agree with that. That's that's well put. Yeah, that is a good point. So I guess I'm putting down as point number four might be a principle rather than a goal, or if it's not a goal, or at least merge some of it with number three and put the rest into it as a principle. Okay, um, I think that's that about number four. Anybody else want to add anything to number three, number four? I will get a, a slightly different comment. Is uh, here we are we are talking about the hardware uh, heterogeneity. Um, another related issue I, uh, I was thinking about is uh, earlier we we mentioned the quantum internet will be uh, evolved in different stages. So right. given that. Uh, in some stages, there could be quantum network number one, which only supports the stage uh, number one capabilities. Another quantum network number two uh, supports more advanced stage. So if this could happen, say there are different quantum networks supporting different stages, uh, how, to, uh, how can they uh, you know, co uh, coexist? Uh, that's a good point, and that's probably, I think that's something that Rod alluded to just a moment ago, that that should be mentioned uh, in the protocol level, because 
that as we evolve networks from first generation to second generation, or at least if they coexist, that they have slightly different error management. I think, yes, I, so basically what you're saying is I'm going to go back to Ross point and that, that should be included properly in hardware heterogeneity, slash hardware slash protocol genera. Should be slightly rephrased, but heterogeneity in some Or we like the quantum network of heterogeneity yes, in the network level. Heterogeneity. Okay. That's a good point. Uh, yeah, so that will tie in back with Rod's point uh, he made a few minutes ago. Okay, we'll do that. Uh, okay. Anything else to add on these two points? No? Uh, okay, so I will move on to point number five. So Security is an interesting one. Uh, I'm going to immediately mention that actually Rodney's group actually, uh, uploaded a paper to archive effectively about security, which, would, uh, which is an interesting read on its own. Uh, but what I was saying at this point, and probably in way too many words, and I should probably cut down in many words, is that on one level, uh, applications in general do their own security verification um, because they often work on an assumption that your source of entangled pairs is actually malicious. Uh, and they have mechanisms built into the protocols to abort if they detect too much information leakage. Uh, but that kind of is one concern. And that kind of just means that two endpoints can communicate can perform quantum application securely, uh, but that doesn't mention anything in the network. All that it says is that the network doesn't actually have to provide a secure, that kind of security guarantee to the application. But at the same time, there are other threats to the network, which may be simply that, well, that the two end nodes just never receive their entangled pair. I'm not an, actually an expert at all on this section, so I definitely would uh, like somebody else to come in who knows more, especially given that Rodney's here and they just released a paper on this, or if some of the other authors of that paper are here could actually chime in on the section. But basically what I'm saying is applications have their own way of verifying end-to-end -end security, but the network should also take care of ensuring the network protocols, uh, that we also limit disruption at the protocol level. And I don't know if there's need, need to say anything more other than networks should take care to limit disruption because they can never provide proper end-to-end -end security. So I have a question about the, this. This Steve Willis. I have a question about the middle paragraph here, which is is difficult uh, at the network level. In, in a way, there's there's two network levels. Certainly, there's the there's a classic control network here, which has a, a security set of issues, and then there's sort of the quantum whatever we're calling it transport or whatever level. What do you mean by network level here in this paragraph? That is a very good question. Uh... Rodney, can I ask you to put the, uh, the uh, URL to your paper in the chat so we can look at that? I'm happy to take a crack at that. Just in the, uh, the Cisco WebEx chat, or you want it somewhere yeah, else? In the WebEx chat, that would be great. Uh, so what I meant about, there you go. Uh, it was mostly just that the network itself. So if you consider yourself just a user that it, that's attached to the network, uh, what I meant by the network level, I effectively meant that that network to which you attach, you the right security. It's kind of just it's just a difficult problem, uh, and I don't think it should be guaranteed by the network because themselves because applications themselves have protocols and capabilities to counteract the idea that perhaps the source of entangled pairs is malicious. Uh, I, I, it's something that is related to security, and it, uh, but it's not it's not really in deep in the in the quantum part of the network. It's the authentication of the users. I mean, you need, at some point you will need to to make sure that you are talking with the right person, the person you think you you are talking with, and the network probably. I mean, the, the infrastructure that that provides this quantum network uh, capability should be able to authenticate the users. For instance, that's related to security. 
Uh, well, part of what a big chunk of what we uh, addressed in in that uh, paper draft is um, operational issues around uh, routing and connection setup and resource management, multiplexing and whatnot, and how um, a bad actor on the network could potentially significantly disrupt operation of the network itself. Um, but this is a this is a relatively this could be a pretty long discussion. So so my suggestion, Wojtek, is, is that we put this on the agenda for for uh, July and uh, get either uh, Sato or uh, Shota to to talk about it. Um, Shota's actually been pounding pretty heavily on on what's going to be draft two of this. Okay, that's a very good point. I I rather not. Security is an enormous topic, I think, and I'm really not an expert, so I don't really feel super comfortable writing about security in this draft. So I, I'm inclined to actually just agree with you to put it on the agenda for the meeting, and perhaps even have a se separate documents for security and over here just the basics. So that's what I was going to suggest. It, things, sorry, sorry, that, that's gonna, sorry. That's what I was going to suggest in the in the way. The existing sort of body of security work in the internet, uh, in the ITF or uh, the RFCs, is a separate set of documents, and it, 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 it because it is um, a, a complicated set of documents, a complicated set. And considering there are multiple control paths and data paths and quantum paths and entanglement paths, I, I think it's we'll never cover it in a paragraph. And so, punt it off to something else. It's the right thing to do for right now, and have it as an agenda item. My suggestion. Just yeah. In terms of the balance of the document, I would say what you have there is is uh, long relative to the other things, and so so trimming it back noticeably would be fun. Uh, can you repeat that? Because I didn't really catch uh, that. Yeah, Steve or anyone else, you know, the the, uh, the paper that I just posted the link to the draft on. We're still actually revising it. We actually haven't sent it off to, to the uh, journal yet. So if anybody wants to look at it in the next few days and offer comments, we'd love to have them. We're we're planning to get it off to the journal. I think early next week is the plan. So, so I will take a look at it because there's a, another project that I have, which is looking at net, get, trying to guarantee security at the network level. And so I'm happy to take a crack at your paper. So think about that. Uh, and so I'll, I'll do, I'll, 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 I know where to track you down. Uh, but you were saying, Ronnie, something about was because I didn't catch what you said about what's currently written. What did you say about what's currently written? Here, this uh, this uh, point five is long relative to the other points in 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 the uh, just in terms of the structure of the document. The others are basically about two paragraphs, and this one's four or five. I would say cut it fifty percent just just to make the uh, just to give the right balance. Yeah, I agree. Uh, I'm going to shorten it and just to make it just to kind of make it more concise. So that would be good. Uh, but in terms of what it says, uh, is it basically? Or do you basically agree with it? Well, I was waiting until we got to the end of the list, but I suppose I could go ahead and bring it up, actually. Playing devil's advocate here for a moment, um, the seven points that you have listed here in the section, if you took out the word quantum, would, would it describe every network built since the dawn of internet working? Uh, so does how much does this set of points actually overall add to the to the to the, uh, the draft as a whole? By the way, we haven't gotten there yet, but the but the next set of stuff on on the uh, on the uh, the principles of of the internet, I love that. I think that's great, and there are things in there that you know, that, that you know, even though I've been working on this for fifteen years, I went, ooh, that's a, that's really nice, and you know, nice insight. But this part, I'm not so sure if it offers if it offers much. Uh, okay, that's a very good point. Uh, so let's get to the end and actually try and answer that question. Uh, or because we still have 25 minutes, uh, I'm, let's go through the remaining points. Let's go through the principles. And if we have time, we'll return to this question as first thing or go offline. But that's a good question. Opposed to keeping this stuff in here, I just don't feel like it adds very much. And so, so, so yeah, I think we could we could consider it just in structurally at some point. Uh, that, that's fine with me. Uh, that's a very good point. Uh, 
I'm just, I just want to go through the remaining points. The, the remaining two goals are going to be very quick. And actually, it comes back to exactly what Rodney mentioned, is these two points are basically kind of verbatim. They don't even say quantum, I think, other than... Uh, well, actually, no, actually, I think maybe 6.6 .6 makes something... Rather than per point being anything new beyond what a classical network would have as a goal, uh, these this list highlights why do we what's different. For example, in this make them easy to manage and monitor, uh, I kind of highlight that in a classical network you can actually read your packet, you can read your headers, you can read even the data of your packet if you so wish. Uh, in a quantum network, your qubit is you can't read it. You can't you can for example a key quantity in quantum networks is fidelity. But you can't just go like, oh, what's my entangled pair's fidelity? You, you can't just easily read that. It requires, if you wanted to keep track of fidelity through the as the entangled pair grows throughout the network, you would need to have a fairly complex uh, entanglement tracking mechanism, density matrix tracking mechanism. Uh, and I guess from this point point of view, I think these goals do add that whilst it's not surprising that they're basically exactly the same as for a classical network. It's important to keep those where they really highlight what's different. Uh, if that makes sense. So at least in the, for example, for point six, uh, it has a point that the qubit is different. Point seven it actually is actually just a repeat of, uh, actually, no, it's not even just a repeat. It mentions there's two channels now. There's a quantum and a classical channel. And that may provide quite various challenges in ensuring availability and resilience. So for example, you may have networks that have one optical fiber between pairs of nodes, which is shared between classical and quantum. You may have two separate fibers, maybe, or maybe it's a fiber and a copper wire. Uh, so I guess from this point of view that these points are not different, but they highlight What's what, what's challenging about these goals on quantum networks that what, that did not exist in a classical network? So having said that, does anybody have any uh, actually in that case since I've already addressed Rodney's point, does anybody have anything to add on goal six, seven, and just generally the concept of having this goal section and uh, relative to how different based on Rod's point? Well, it, not necessarily connected to Rod's point, but one of the interesting ways to think about goals is what are non-goals here, and that you know it does them. Are there no double negative, no non-goals, um, or are there explicit non-goals here? Uh, and, and just to throw one out, which again I completely agree with, is we're not supporting. But CV is not part of this document, um, or, or you know heterogeneity is. You know, qubit heterogeneity is not supported, or something like that. Do we have any sort of big tent non-goal items in this section? Uh, good question. And, and again, it's just a, it's just a, it's, it's more to think about what your goals are by contrasting with your non-goals. It's not. I'm not trying to explicitly say that, but it's just a way to think about this. And you know. Just we're doing something different because it's quantum and we can't do it classically. Or I'm trying to come up with something. I, the reason why is I there's not a lot of non-goals, which makes this kind of like a reasonable generic set of goals. That was not helpful. Sorry. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm just thinking. Um, uh, does anybody else have anything to add? The thing which is interesting about um, I think six uh, is that it talks about what's different, um, and I think some of the problems with, with five are that it takes a you know, the, the fifth point that it takes a while to get to highlighting what, what's different with the quantum security and, and how that affects the goals. That helps. Yeah, the, the first couple of paragraphs of number five are, are quite generic, and then the, the, the third paragraph starts talking about what's different and what, what makes it what makes it interesting. 
um, and six, but, but six is much clearer about highlighting, okay, what, why is a quantum network different and how does this affect the goals? That's a good point. So uh, I think, yes. So if all these goals are carefully, I would, would I reread all these goals and they should all carefully, especially to, just to address Rod's point, uh, we shouldn't be stating stuff that's kind of known from classical networks, but it's worth highlighting goals based on why is it different in quantum network. Cool. Uh, well, this can all this kind of discussion can keep going on the mailing list afterwards. After my plan is to edit all this based on this discussion, and then it's still up for discussion on the mailing list, and at the upcoming IETF meeting. Um, Hi, this is just Sean Turner. Just to jump in there, I think it's it's useful to list that you know you're not trying to be any different, and maybe you could have a paragraph at the beginning that says you know um, quantum networks um, you know want to ensure the same things as classical, and here are the ones that are different. Right, okay. Because I, I think you, you're gonna end up with like, you're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't. If you blow this section away, people are gonna ask, what are your goals, right? And this mm -hmm. section I think is also targeted not at the people that are deeply involved, it's targeted to casual observers like me who are showing up and just reading the document. Right, yeah, so point is to say this, a lot of these goals are not new, but here we, and the, the, it's very important that at every point it really focuses on the difference rather than just repeating uh, sentences such as like in point seven, there is a practical and usable network is able to continue and operate despite losses and failures, blah, 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 which is something you'd want to say about any network. Uh, the point is that this kind of point should be like point six, which starts that the fundamental unit of quantum information is a qubit, which cannot be actively monitored as any readout irreversibly destroys its contents. So kind of this section is rephrased to really, really uh, drive these differences uh, that might make it more worthwhile. So yes, okay, thank you for that. Anything else? If, if you're highlighting differences, I mean, I think highlighting differences is important, but, but also highlight the things which are the same. You know, otherwise you run the risk that people are going to read this and say, well, you know, they don't care about you know, re resilience, for example, because you haven't explicitly called it out. Uh, but you don't need to say much about the things that are the same, but I don't think you should just not mention them. Thank you. That and also, it's uh, very, very positive. Uh, you cannot tell the contents of a qubit without destroying it. However, you can keep track by counting of where two different, uh, the, the two ends of the qubit are at, the, at any one time. And that is going to maybe more interesting for monitoring than the actual qubit contents. Uh, yes, that is very much correct. Uh, so it actually introduces a new challenge uh, to quantum networking because whilst in, whilst in classical networks, you only have to keep track of where a single packet is as it goes through the network. Uh, here, at any time, you have to monitor the location of two qubits. So that's a worth point adding. Um, cool. Uh, anything else to add on the goals? We only have about 15 minutes left, so I want to move on to the principles section before we conclude. So, other than that, we move everything. We can move to the offline mailing list discussion. Okay. Um, so principles versus goals. Uh, I think we've already touched on this. Uh, the goals were meant to be more like, what are we striving towards? And the principles are more like how. Uh, originally, I had more points here, but I've removed the ones which I felt were my opinion and were not sufficiently gen general. Because uh, I think it's quite important that in this document, it tries to make no claim on what is the right architecture. Uh, it's, it, that was actually quite important to me. Uh, so basically, we'll similarly, there's fewer points, there's only four, uh, and they're shorter. Uh, we'll go over them and we'll, we'll see what we uh, can discuss. And I already <laughs> think I know what the first comment might be about the point number one, which is in point number one, I say that the bell pairs, the entangled pairs, are the fundamental building block. As we've already discussed, we build entanglement by creating these elementary link pairs and then extending them. Uh, 
But there's also the question that often comes up is multipartite entanglement. And I guess my question to everybody is, especially those who understand multipartite entanglement, is it worth mentioning multipartite entanglement in this point, or is it okay to keep the principles of basically saying we're building everything from entangled pairs, uh, specifically bell pairs? I, I think you need to. Uh, sorry, go ahead. I think you need to do multipartite. You need, I don't think you need to give. I don't think, I don't think you need to add more, but I think you need to acknowledge it. Sorry, who was that speaking? I'm, sorry, Steve Willis. Apologize. Thanks. You could as well use a term that is uh, that includes everything, like uh, instead of pairs, and like you know, uh, uh, multiplet or whatever. Rather, just say entanglement, and then specify entanglement can come as an entangled pair or as multipartite entanglement. That's, that's we know that bell pairs alone are sufficient. Maybe more efficient to to to, uh, to use um, larger states that are actually produced by the network. So we know that applications may want multi-party states, and they can either build those by using bell pairs, or they can ask the, the network to do something more efficiently. Um, so it's partly that distinction between application and and what the network what's minimum functionality that the network has to promise. Um, but the, uh, so, you, so I think in sentence acknowledging that, that, that there may be cases where, where it's desirable for the network to create multi-party states in support of applications that want them. Bell pairs are sufficient as, as a minimum functionality. So I would just change the title then to say bell pairs are the minimal fun fundamental building block and that completely works for me. Okay, so I think what I'll do is, uh, yeah, you know, yeah, just one point. I mean, if if you want to meet the goal that we don't support a specific application, and especially we want to support tomorrow's distributed quantum application, we have to make sure that we don't write something that is too restrictive. Okay, and 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 probably that's that, that's where that's one reason to include multipartite, or or at least to to use a word that could be understood as pairs or more. And um, and uh, uh, yes, and so maybe the, the fundamental building block, instead of be being bell pairs, is just entanglement or quantum correlation. Yeah. So you know uh, uh, the last sentence of of uh, point one there, which is it says use essentially using bell pairs uh, to build more complex entangled states. I think covers. Not it's as Rodney mentioned. It's uh, this is actually not guaranteed. To, it's quite possible that having the network give you the more complex entangled state to start with has such performance gains and efficiency gains that it might be uh, that this that the network should not itself be confined to entangled pairs. So I'm going to go with what Matthias said and not make this principle restrictive, uh, but make sure that it states what needs to be stated. Uh, cool. Uh, in the interest of time, I'm going to move on unless somebody has very important to say. No. Uh, point number two is uh, this is something that the phys <laughs> physicists may not like the phrasing, but I say that bell pairs are indistinguishable provided they both satisfy the required fidelity threshold. Uh, so what I effectively mean is that in a quantum internet, applications will often request entanglement above a particular threshold. And the thing is, if they requested it above a particular threshold, they don't actually care if it's just a bit above the threshold or if it's a lot above the threshold. And if you've got a node that holds multiple entangled pair, uh, ends of entangled pairs of different fidelities, then it doesn't really have to distinguish between the ones that are for the same fidelity. And this may, I'm not actually saying how this translates into pro protocol design or how it translates to network design, but the point is that you don't actually, it's effectively that, that's kind of just saying that, <laughs> that pairs are kind of reusable bound to this fidelity threshold. So it's not like when you send a packet with particular user data, well, it has that user data and has to reach its destination with this particular identifiers. These entangled pairs can be, Reuse and it, it kind of allows for certain 
uh, new strategies in your network. So for example, you, if you know that you're going to have a demand for a particular fidelity, you can pre-generate some entangled pairs of a particular fidelity and simply give them out when the demand arrives. It's not exactly possible with today's hardware, but it might be as our quantum memories improve. Uh, and I think that's the kind of point I was making with that. And I feel this is actually quite a good principle. So anybody have opinions on this? I, I, I'm afraid the resource reuse is a bit misleading. As a wording. Do, 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 do. Wait, where did, I, where did I say resource reuse? Or did I just, oh, well, oh yeah, there is enabling reuse of resource. OK. How is that misleading? Uh, just so that I understand. No, because, because you might understand it. I mean, if you are not from the from the field, you might understand it that you that you have one pair that can be used for something, and then the same pair can be used for a, for uh, for something else after having been used for the for for the first thing, which is not possible, of course. But uh, yes, but I it's agree. Missing. Yes, uh, very good point. Thank you. Uh, anything else? Cool. Uh, the last two points, I'm going to touch both kind of together. Uh, one states fidelity is part of the service, and one says time is part of the service. Fidelity is part of the service kind of simply states, you can't just say, I want 10 untangled pairs per second, because in a, it's kind of meaningless to say that unless you say, I want 10 untangled pairs per second, have at least fidelity 0 0.7, or I want because the same link may potentially provide you with higher fidelity pairs, but a lower throughput. Uh, and what if your link cannot simply deliver the fidelity you need, such as, for example, maybe 0. Point, you need a fidelity of 0. 0.9. And if your link can deliver 100 entangled pairs, but can never deliver them at 0. 0.9, then that link is potentially useless to you. So that's kind of what I mean, fidelity is part of the service. Uh, and I feel it's a, so, yes? No, it's just, it's okay because because when you read this in the first place, you understand that you okay. Uh, Wojtek has uh, identified a key performance indicator of the system. That's fine. We need some, but what is specific to this one? And actually, what I understand from what you have just said is that it's specific because there is a threshold beyond which it's useless. Yes. It's not it's not quantitative. It's qualitative. Okay. Yes, I see. It, it's 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 not just another KPI. I mean, it's uh, okay. That's a good it's point. Something uh, it's functional request. Yes, that's a uh, that's actually quite worrying that that didn't come through. But I I should include that. Basically, what I just said should be said in the text. Uh, okay. And uh, before I ask questions, uh, time is part of the service. Uh, Effectively, it's kind of highlighting the complications with early stage networks, which are, whilst, as, whilst often I go about how we should support networks in the future, a lot of these limitations are going to be with us for a long time. Uh, and they're essentially that we're used to now that, for example, classical memories kind of drop information not because they expire in time, but because you know we don't have more space. Whereas in quantum, uh, repeaters, at least, your information may expire simply because well, it's become useless. It's decreased below a certain the fidelity threshold. You can no longer use it, and this happens currently quite fast. And there's work on improving it, uh, but there's also other limitations, such as rates across the link. And uh, for example, if I feel that time is also an important part of the service, because what if your application needs multiple entangled pairs? at the same time to operate on them, then it must receive the last entangled pair of this lot within a specific amount of time after the first one. Because if it because it needs them all at the same time, and they all need to be above a certain fidelity at the same time. Uh, so that's kind of what I mean by time is also part of the service. 
is that the user also actually will may need to specify that as their requirement, if that's made it clear. Any questions? Hi, uh, Vujic. Uh, one quick comment uh, is about the service. So, um, number three, number four principle mentioned service. I was wondering, do we have this service well defined somewhere uh, in the sections? Uh, good question. I think there's something roughly. Uh, Something, oh, there's a very brief, actually, there's only very briefly said. And I basically say a detailed list of such requirements is beyond the scope of the memo. No, no. Uh, no. Uh, there's a relate, there was a related draft that specified uh, the link layer service. So, whilst it specified a link layer service, a lot of it is actually designed with applications in mind. Uh, so, it may be worth actually reviving that draft to kind of address what does it mean this service is. Uh, if that makes sense. Uh, does everybody um, know what I'm talking about? Probably not. Uh, yes, I, I know that document. Uh, I, I guess that service is, uh, is like the um, between the link layer and the uh, network layer. But I, I, I guess uh, somewhere in this document also mentioned the service, the major service provided by quantum internet is the entanglement distribution. So that one is more like the network layer. So I, I, I guess those two examples just to show the service could be in different layers. I, I was thinking if we can describe or define the service somewhere, and then now we, when we talk about the design principle, and then we can use that definition more clearly. Yes, okay, so I agree that if the word service is to be used, it needs to be defined more clearly what that means. Uh, because yes, I agree. It's not strictly specified, not well defined. Uh, okay. Uh, I, I have a I have a general question, which is possibly also another can of worms. Uh, is does in fact fidelity being part of the service? What's the relation to for fidelity and error correction here? In that, do we are is error correction a layer above? this particular comment in fidelity is part of the service or is it or do we have error correction integrated into what we want to do and i'm just I, I i and one of the services i think here is error correction that is support we say fidelity is part of the service perhaps bringing out that in fact um being able to support a variety of error correction techniques and I, I just don't know about enough about error correction to know whether this works. But I, I want to, uh, being able to support error correction is important. Yes, good point. Um, and again, I don't know whether, I, I just can't tell whether section three says it's got a, fidelity is certainly important. In order to do that, we need to make sure that we don't break any error correction protocols. I think that's an excellent point, and I think mentioning um, error correction in that paragraph is actually a really good idea. Um, I think error correction is one of the ways of achieving fidelity. So we have two basic approaches. There's entanglement purification, which is basically error detection, and then if you have substantially better systems, then you can then you can put in uh, error correction. And so so there are two separate ways of of achieving the, the, that, that goal of providing fidelity as part of the service. But yeah, I think calling out error correction explicitly in this paragraph is a good idea. In, in, in particular, for example, the network, the IP network layer does have a checksum, so it will detect and throw away errors. Um, but it means that in fact, you can build better error correction protocols on top of that, and it's designed to support that particular layer. I think, I think that making sure that a goal here is that we support um, a variety of error correction protocols, error detection and error correction. So, anyhow, more worms. Uh, no, but that's a good point. It should be mentioned uh, that how we'll pro probably mention that error correction is a way, as Rodney said, is a way to achieving this fidelity. Right. So, as we are out of time, 
I'm going to post the minutes of this meeting uh, on the data tracker and on the mailing list. Uh, and we have a few discussion points to continue on on the mailing list. But what I will do, basically, is currently take what we've discussed, include that in the draft, uh, address also a bunch of other comments that have since piled in to the draft since about March. Uh, and then I plan to actually, then it's basically ready for a kind of to start the last rounds of review by the group before completing it. Hopefully, maybe by July IETF meeting, uh, maybe the next one. Uh, but there doesn't seem to be much work to do. But that's basically what I'm going to do. Uh, the remaining discussions will proceed on the mailing list. Um, OK. Uh, thanks a lot, everybody. I just have one request before uh, I conclude. Can those people who have only initials on their participant's name uh, tell me what their full name is for the purposes of attendance? Because otherwise, I've stolen the list from the uh, uh, WebEx attendees. Uh, so that's about it. OK. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for organizing everything. So as people leave, can uh, JW, thank you. And there's a Thompson J if, and a JM Kim, if you could let me know, and an Olivier without a last name. Uh. Right, I'm gone to my next meeting is actually starting. <laughs> OK, thank you. So I've got Olivier, thank you. Um, Thompson J. You and I should chat sometime between now and and uh, the July IETF on the uh, yeah just about organizational stuff for that. Um, the uh, I don't think we need to talk anything more about getting the request in for to the to the uh, for for the for the meeting time. If you want to go ahead and commit that. Oh, so you don't have any time requirements? No, I'll just submit it then. Uh, well, I've I've emailed you a couple of other constraints I'd like to add. Uh, okay. Uh, thank you, James Thompson. Uh, I did not think about time because I, I actually had not considered what time is this actually going to be running. Um, actually, that's a good point because IETFs actually, I don't know how that's going to conflict with our uh, end of semester schedule, but you know, it's off by 12 hours or something anyway. So, IETF scheduling is going to be tight this time because of the ANRW happening at the same time. All right. So it, the main time zone for that for for IETF this time is where? Um, it's late, late afternoon European start starting in the afternoon European time. So it's happening about now. So this is like bedtime for me, right? <laughs> yeah, I think it's about five or six hours a day starting at uh, UPM, UTC or something like that. I forget the exact times, but about that. It's eleven to sixteen. I've, I've, okay. One UTC, so 13 UTC. So early in the day would be good for me. So I might just state that. That makes it late, that makes it late evening my time, right? So I'm, I'll just add a statement saying the earlier the better. Okay. okay. So early in the day UTC time, 11 or 12 or even 13 would be all right. Yeah, I think that also quite works. Better UTC too. starts starts to be middle of my night. Yeah. yeah so st stick that into the request in the additional notes, and the, the secretary will do their best. Yeah. I go to bed at a reasonable hour. Um, Shota now works for an employer, and so he keeps something approximating regular hours. But he's he's still sort of you know a twenty four hour person, and likewise for Sato. So. <laughs> we should try to get. Uh, we should probably try to get Sh uh, Sato to actually talk about the uh, the attacking the quantum internet one at the meeting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It like there was some interest in that. Yeah. Uh, okay. Interesting. All right, I got to go to my next meeting. Okay. Uh, I think I've got everybody's names then. Okay, I'm done here as well. Thanks, everybody. Yeah. Okay. Bye. Bye.